Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 20, A Blank Canvas. I know, I know, it's been two weeks since the last episode, and you might have been wondering whether I had given up. No worries. I mean, I went on holiday to Portugal with the family for a week, which is lovely, and then I spent the last few days getting the History of the Germans podcast website going. Check it out. It's under www.historyofthegermans.com. There are maps, there are images and transcripts, as well as blog posts that hopefully make the podcast more enjoyable and easier to follow. But now I'm back and raring to go. In this episode, as announced, we are going to take a look at how the Ottonians were perceived by their successors, and in particular in the 19th and 20th century. Why does it matter, you ask? Isn't that something for the history seminar at university? Well, German history is always always contentious, and even the Ottonians, reigning a thousand years ago, are still extremely contentious. Just to give you an example, I had a comment on one of my social media posts accusing the podcast of being nationalistic and suggesting that nobody should listen to it. I think once you've listened to this episode, you will understand that this person was not your average social media troll, but was coming from a perspective I can understand, though I fundamentally disagree with it. Okay, so let's get going. The first and probably most important point to make is that the time of the Ottonians is a blank canvas. There are very few written sources. For Henry the Fowler and Otto the Great, the Regesta Imperii, which is the list of all royal charters, contains about a thousand documents, most of which are land donations to monasteries, etc. Now, if you compare that to King Sigismund, 1410 to 1437, there are about 14,000 registered documents, though his reign was a mere third of the first Ottonians. On top of that, the contemporary chroniclers like Lyud Pran, Widukind and Tietmar are more interested in saints' miracles than political analysis. Not a single word or thought Henry the Fowler and Otto the Great have said or thought has been written down. Only by the time of Otto III do we get statements that can be directly attributed and that give us a glimpse of their personality and political ambitions. And there are no portraits at all of these rulers. There are images, yes, but these images are conveying a message of what a king should look like, not what he actually looked like. Therefore, what you end up with is a map showing an empire much larger than any other subsequent political infrastructure in Western Europe, and on which you can project whatever narrative you want. And that is exactly what happens. During the Middle Ages and the early modern period, the Ottonians were certainly remembered, and we find impressive works commissioned in their memory, like the funeral monument to Henry II and Kunigunde in Bamberg Cathedral, created by Tilman Riemenschneider, Germany's foremost sculptor of the time. However, their fame was eclipsed by the veneration reserved for Charlemagne, who was canonized in the 12th century, and an extraordinary reliquary was made to hold his bones. Even the imperial crown, which was likely made for an Ottonian ruler, maybe even Otto the Great, ended up being called the Crown of Charlemagne. The Enlightenment of the 18th century dismissed the whole of the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages, where people were held down by superstition and armed thugs on horseback. That is a time where the Ottonian churches were drowned in Baroque decorations until they were hardly recognisable. Interest in the Ottonians, in particular Otto the Great, emerged during the 19th century, during and after the Napoleonic Wars. The French Revolution did not only give birth to liberté, égalité and fraternité, but it also gave birth to its ugly twin, nationalism. Suddenly everyone in Europe wanted to be living in a national state. Now that's relatively unproblematic if you're French or English or Swedish because the infrastructure of a nation state was already there. But that was much more of an issue if you were, say, Italian or German. These countries did not have a national infrastructure, but consisted of a multitude of independent polities. And each nation created its own historical narrative to prove that they had always shared the same identity and had been destined to rule a certain territory or the world. England was able to draw a straight line from William the Conqueror, the Hundred Years' War and the Tudors to the Empire. France created its own storyline out of Jeanne d'Arc, 
and then it was a bit of a pick and mix depending on political affiliation of Henri Quatre, Louis XIV, Lafayette, the French Revolution, and then above all, Napoleon. And so the people who spoke the German language too were scrambling around for a past full of glory as a unified nation dominating their territory. And that notion ran into a whole busload of problems. First up, the more recent past had very little on offer when it came to glory and unity. After the humiliating defeat in the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, the Holy Roman Empire had been dissolved, Emperor Francis II had put down the crown of Charlemagne, and the institutions of the state like the Reichskammergericht and the immerwährende Reichstag were just closed. Moreover, by order of Napoleon, the hundreds of German states were reduced to 39, which became satellite states of France, destined to provide soldiers to die in the Russian steppes. Looking further back also yielded comparatively little. The towering figure of Germany in the 18th century was Frederick II of Prussia, but he was no good as a unifying figure since most of his wars were against Austria, a fellow German state. Plus, he avoided speaking German whenever possible. Going back one century further, the 17th century had no time for heroes either, as the Thirty Years' War killed two-thirds of the population. The 16th century, two key figures were Martin Luther and Charles V, neither of whom a unifying figure in a country split 50-50 between Catholics and Protestants. And then you have the 15th and 14th century, which was a time of weak emperors and fragmentation, so no time for national heroes. And that meant you had to go all the way back to the early and high Middle Ages to find a time of glory, and that is where the Ottonians, the Salians and the Staufer emperors come in. Wilhelm von Giesebrecht, 1814-1889, and his Geschichte der Deutschen Kaiserzeit, or History of the Time of the German Empress, perfectly encapsulates this notion. Let me quote from the preface of his monumental works. Though the importance of these times for the development of world history is broadly recognized, it does hold a very special meaning for our people. Not only did the emperors emerge from Germany, and Germany had become the seat of power during this period, but it was also the time where the German stems, for the first time unified in a common political entity that separated themselves from the surrounding peoples. We became our own peoples, who could pursue our own unique and special developments in church, state, arts and science. Moreover, during the time of the German emperors, the German people were strong through unity, so that they reached the highest power, being free not only to decide its own affairs, but also to command other nations, where the German man was the most respected and the name of Germany had the greatest resonance. Sounds good. Time of unity and strength, a time when Germany ruled most of Europe, all boxes ticked. Should be a great national narrative. But here comes the second problem. Where is Germany? what is in and what is not in Germany. The key question at the time was, are the Austrians in, and hence should the Austrian emperor be the head of the new nation state, or should the Austrians stay out, leaving Prussia in charge? That debate also has a religious dimension, as a Prussian-dominated Germany would be majority Protestant, whilst an Austrian inclusion would tilt it towards Catholicism. And so, almost as soon as Giesebrecht, who took a somewhat neutral stance, had published his works, the debate over the so-called Großdeutsche or Kleindeutsche Lösung turned history seminars into boxing rings. In the Prussian corner, we have Heinrich von Sübel, 1817-1895, an accomplished historian and, like Giesebrecht, trained by the godfather of modern history, Leopold von Ranke. He argued that Henry the Fowler was the greatest Ottonian ruler, since he focused on unifying the German stems, defending the realm against the Magyars and expanding eastwards. On the other hand, Otto the Great was misguided and did terrible harm to Germany by going after the imperial crown. The entanglement in Italy forced him and his successors to waste blood and treasure in fruitless fights with the Italian states and most of all with the papacy. Taking the eye of the ball in Germany allowed the local princes to expand their power, which ultimately led to the collapse of central authority in Germany 
and all the misery ever since. His bottom line was that Germany should focus on inner unity and coherence and avoid entanglement with foreigners in general and Roman Catholics in particular. In the Austrian corner we have Johann von Ficker, 1826-1902, unfortunate name but also a gifted writer. He argued that the imperial project of Otto the Great and Otto III was neither a true empire nor a nation-state, but an ambitious and benevolent attempt to bring together the members of multiple nations under one roof and under one emperor. It was no coincidence that this model of the reign of Otto the Great looked a lot like the Austrian Empire, which comprised many nations, including Hungarians, Czechs, Poles, Croats, Slovaks, Slovenians and many more, which Ficker believed happily lived under Emperor Franz Josef. Otto the Great and Otto III were his heroes. Fun fact, both Sibyl and Ficker were disappointed by Bismarck's creation of the German Reich in 1871. Ficker for obvious reasons, because Austria was out, but Sibyl as well, because he was at heart a liberal, and he had hoped for a less autocratic, more open society. From then on, German historians began ordering the medieval emperors into categories of good or bad, depending on whether their policies appeared more like Henry the Fowler's perceived focus on Germany and Eastern expansion, or Otto the Great's perceived globalism. Whether despite or because of the debate about who was better, Henry the Fowler or Otto the Great, the Ottonians became the reference point for the German national narrative. It was seen as a period of great national success that anyone could ultimately be proud of. It was a bit like the Hundred Years' War for both Britain and France, a time of great heroism, towering successes and occasional tragic failures. But it was also a narrative for conquests in the East that did influence German thinking into the world wars. The greatest travesty happened during the Nazi regime. The Nazis began to style Henry the Fowler as the more German king, who they believed was also more racially pure. The latter was an extremely harebrained notion since it related to Otto's paternal grandmother Hedwig, being of Frankish and Italian descent. How that works when Hedwig is also Henry's mother is lost in muddled Nazi logic. But that stupid racial argument was by no means the worst thing. Heinrich Himmler and the SS took over the Abbey Church of Quedlinburg, where Henry the Fowler had been buried. In 1938 they destroyed the altar and interior decorations and created the Weihestätte der SS, a sort of secular Nazi chapel to consecrate SS fighters into the force. Himmler was completely obsessed with Henry the Fowler and even believed he had communed with the dead king in his chapel. His entourage even called him King Henry. No surprise that after the war the name of King Henry the Fowler was mud. I went to school in the 1980s and I cannot remember him being mentioned at all. Which is really sad given the fact that for all we know, Henry the Fowler was the exact opposite of a Nazi, always looking for reconciliation, friendship agreements and ruling as a first amongst equals. Otto the Great was also taken off the list in both West and East Germany. There were no celebrations for the thousand years since his coronation as emperor in 1962 or the thousand year anniversary of his death in 1973. When West Germany looked at the Middle Ages in the 1970s and 1980s, it looked at the empire of Charlemagne. Charlemagne was comfortable because the Carolingian Empire was seen as a pan-European polity, an early EU if you like. Sharing the memory of Charlemagne with France was one of the manifestations of the Deutsch-Französische Freundschaft, the German-French friendship. A concept like the special relationship between the US and the UK. The Ottonians were gradually readmitted by claiming that a true German history only started in the middle of the 11th century and what happened before was just an extension of the good Carolingian times. Karl Bosel even included them in the late antiquity. Teofano was hailed as a rare example of openness towards other cultures and the Teofano Foundation awards an annual prize for individuals and organizations that make an outstanding contribution to bridging Europe's historic diversities. East Germany, in line with Marxist theory, 
regarded the early Middle Ages as a transition period from slave-owning antiquity to feudalism, where individual rulers would have little agency in the first place. They also had, for obvious reasons, little enthusiasm for the Ottonian policy of Eastern expansion. They believed the Western interpretation of the Ottonians as proto-European was just a smokescreen hiding bourgeois nationalist desires for world domination. Okay, thank you so much for listening to this point. You really have a lot of stamina, because all this stuff is clearly bollocks. The Ottonians were neither proto-Europeans nor forerunners of a German national state. All of these narratives are nothing but projections of their contemporary narratives onto the empty canvas of a time we have very few facts about. So already from 1880s onwards, more enlightened scholars insisted on trying to understand the early Middle Ages on their own terms. That trend really gained traction in the 80s and 90s, and today dominates the debate. When you look at the time of the Ottonians on their own terms, as I have tried as well, all the debates of the 19th and early 20th century disappear. Getting involved in Italian affairs was not anything new Otto the Great had come up with. The Dukes of Swabia and Bavaria had constantly meddled in affairs south of the Alps without thinking about any long-term consequences. King Arnulf of Carinthia had gone to Italy, besieged Rome and taken the imperial crown. Aiming for the imperial crown and its inherent mission was much of a choice for whoever happened to be the strongest ruler within the Carolingian Empire. And Otto certainly did not think in categories of German national interest at all. According to Widukind, he identified first and foremost as Saxon. Or it might just be that Widukind, who definitely identified first and foremost as Saxon, projected his bias onto Otto the Great. Equally, Otto III talks about being an uncouth Saxon, wanting to be a sophisticated Greek, and doesn't say anything about Germans. The other big transition in the perception of the Ottonians related to the internal organization of the kingdom. The prevailing view well into the 1980s was that the Ottonians and Salians ran the kingdom through the bishops and abbots. The imperial church system was seen as a tight-knit structure with a cadre of bishops available to the emperor at his beck and call. These church leaders would receive donations in exchange for providing the financial and military resources whenever the emperor asked for it. In exchange, the empress would gradually shift land, positions and money from the aristocracy into church hands. That narrative suited the 19th century historians extremely well for two reasons. First, it supported the notion that to unify Germany you needed a strong central power with a control and command hierarchy. And secondly, it provided a superbly convenient narrative about how the mighty empire had fallen. The story goes a bit like that. The popes regained moral authority thanks to the Gregorian reforms in the middle of the 11th century and then took control over the German bishops away from the empress. Having lost their main source of power, the empress could no longer hold down the princes and so the state fragmented until it became a mere spectre by the time the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved in 1806. That can be shortened down to the evil popes caused Germany's weakness which is a really good story if you want Protestant Prussia to lead the new Germany. It took until 1982 when Timothy Reuter fundamentally challenged the notion of a coherent imperial church system. He highlighted the inability of, for instance, Otto the Great to first create and then staff the Archbishopric of Magdeburg. He pointed out that most bishops came from the high aristocracy and that in many rebellions the bishops were leading the charge against the king. Now, once you've removed the idea of a coherent exercise of power through the church, the question is, how did the Ottonians rule? Current scholarship focuses much on the symbols and rituals of kingship, which is believed to have been the means by which the kings and empress coordinated activity and resolved conflict. You have heard many times about the process of submission to the king and the obligation of the king to raise the supplicant back up into the royal favour. And you also heard from me about the docks to be carried to Magdeburg as a means of ritual humiliation. Equally, you saw in the narrative that the empress moved from a purely political notion of kingship under Henry the Fowler to a predominantly religiously supported idea of sacred kingship under Henry II. 
The notion that a ruler has been consecrated and thereby has been appointed by God was an inherent source of power and protection. I think I said in episode 11 that Otto III is unlikely to have survived the first six months of his reign had he only been elected but not consecrated. I did spare you most of the detailed explanations of the imperial images in illuminated manuscripts which historians use to understand the notion of kingship, for instance, of Henry II versus Otto the Great. And I completely shielded you from debates about the significance of the use of lead in imperial seals. The reason I left this out is that, despite reading lots and lots of articles about these, I could not tie this into any set of arguments I believed myself. But what I do gather from these discussions is that today's historians see the Ottonians and their empire as a system of coordination, where the ruler exercises power in agreement with at least his magnates. And the magnates are being kept in line through a shared belief in the sacrality of the kingship reinforced through rituals. Now here's what I'm wondering. Despite 200 years of intense scholarship, we still have only a small set of known facts at our disposal when assessing the 10th century. If it is a blank canvas, to what extent do current biases drive the assessment of the Ottonians? Are we projecting the last 30 years of a globalizing economy onto these long dead polities? Are we seeing coordination mechanisms like the EU and the UN that do not have themselves power in the itinerant imperial courts? Do we see a reflection of rituals like the G7 and the imposition and then removal of sanctions in the way 10th century emperors dealt with their adversaries? Do we see the belief in global values as the source of soft power foreshadowed by the concept of the sacred king? Maybe, if people listen to this podcast in 15 years' time, they will regard it as ridiculously outdated. Maybe by then, these kings and emperors will be seen as ruthless thugs who cynically exploited the beliefs of the people to satisfy their greed and lust for power. Now let's hope not, because that would make the place behind the projector quite uncomfortable. So before I go, let me just remind you that the next episode is a Q&A where you can ask any questions you like related to the podcast, the Atonians and the history of the Germans in general. Some of you have already sent some really great questions, and I hope I will be able to get through all of them in two weeks' time. See you then.